Thank you very much, Peter. Um, uh, uh, what I'm going to present is still a kind of a work in progress, so it's not so elaborated in detail as it should be, and as I was supposed to do so until now. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's basically this sketch of some ideas and uh, and above all, I just wanted to, you know, to present it to you, to you and in a way to receive some uh, reactions and to check up consistency of, the, of these ideas so I have to uh, present to you. So uh, I just want to uh, give a few preliminary remarks uh, in order to, uh, to specify the purpose of my talk more closely and to avoid some misunderstandings. A uh, general idea of my talk appeared to me a few years ago in the midst of economical crisis. Economy was suddenly imposed on us as a only language of reality, only language social reality speaks and can be understood with. Even political debates adopted its terms. Remember only this term <laughs> deficit of democracy, you know, that is basically critique of polit political legitimacy or legitimacy this is itself put in the e economical terms as it is uh, you know we have problems of deficit budget and we have also deficit of deficit of, uh, deficit of democracy not to uh, speak about the revival of political economy who once again displaced or simply identified the political with a certain certain economical theory or at least it made them indistinguishable. But uh, what is exactly the problem here for me? It is certainly not the very possibility of contamination of politics, and I imply by politics here both practice, political, political action and thinking, political thinking in the Aldiserian sense of theoretical practice, meaning political effects, by economy, intrusion of its territory or pureness, since I do not believe in political purity. More fundamental, um, more fundamental contradiction here seems to be the one between equality as the, the fundamental principle of politics. There is no need to say that I imply, uh, when I say politics, emancipatory politics. And uh, emancipation, one could just uh, conflate with politics as such. And the principle of general equivalency incorporated, for example, in monetary equivalency as the basic principle of economy. I will develop this uh, rather schematic formulation later. Around the same time, uh, a few years ago, it was like 2013, I was attracted to a book by um, Jean-Joseph Gou, Symbolical Economy, after Marx and Freud. There he advocated the more or less rigid homology, not only analogy, that is to say also to a certain extent equivalency between economy, particularly Marxist one, and structural conception of human and social sciences. In the introduction of the book, he says, my reading of Marx's contribution of political economy, for example, convinced me that certain categories of semiotics and linguistics and structural psychoanalysis over overlapped those already in place in the economic domain and there and uh, I just have to shift uh, and uh, very very early on on the intersections and conceptual parallels among these fields held my attention. The remarkable structural parallel between money and language which Saussure himself sketches on the basis of the notion of value, much closer and complex than simple analogy so often alluded to, struck me as decisive juncture, rich in ramifications. Further, Jean-Joseph Gou will try to establish common denominator of all these fields. It then appeared to me more specifically that these connections could be conceived in terms of phenomenon of exchange, the semiotic, economic and psychologic and psychoanalytical horizons all emphasized question of substitution and, co and its correlative value. Finally, third side of triangle that frames my object here is the um, reappearance of certain correlation between equivalence and equality, sometimes antagonistic and sometimes complementary, 
in contemporary political thinking, notably in authors like Ernesto Laclau and Jacques Rancière, but some elements could also find in Balibar and Badiou. So uh, here we have a group of authors who constructed their political thought in the aftermath of structuralism, drawing consequences of its collapse, which one can situate around May 68 as a sort of political break of an epistemological break, if you want. For example, Badiou is one of those who changed significantly uh, his position around that time in his concept of model and articles in Cahiers pour de l'analyse, pour l'analyse, I don't know what he was. He was strongly affirming uh, priority of the structure at the cost of the subject. And one can say that symbolic at the cost of the real. And then under the influence of Maoism, he turned uh, to the real as an empty place where subject is this time to appear, notably in his theory of subject. But contrary to Badiou, one might say that uh, other authors rather confirm symbolical as the proper terrain of political. That is to say that according to Rancière and Laclau, at least, the very act of symbolization, if you want formalization, a notion more dear to Badiou, is political one and vice versa. And determining principles of any symbolization, that is to say of binding heterogeneous elements into single entity of formation, not only that of social nature, but also that of rational and discursive nature, are precisely principles of equivalence and equality. Laclau and Rossier will go even further, suggesting that politics is also an affair of distinguishing procedures which construct sense as sense, different from nonsense, and logos different from non-logos. Principle of equivalence here is so also crucial. It is the one that determines extent of exchangeability or reversibility of different linguistical, semiotic, or social properties. In what follows, I will try to show which transformations the notion of equivalence has undergone from structuralism until our days, how it supported the structuralist project, and finally, in which rela relation is it to equality, and particularly political one, and to politics itself. I would like to propose here three concepts of equivalence, developed or just presupposed, it doesn't matter, successively one after each other, but which obviously exist and compete today between themselves. <coughs> First is concept of strong equivalence. It enables wide range exchange of signs and values between different fields of knowledge and practices. It resembles the most economy of exchange of goods without obstacles. It enabled precisely this homology between political economy, semiotics and structural psychoanalysis. Jean-Joseph Gou mentioned above. It enabled easy borrowing of elements from one system to another and vice versa. <coughs> one of the most obvious uses of this strong equivalency is semiology of Roland Barthes. Here, equivalence becomes the regime of total indifference of visual or linguistic signs, where the signified is forever lost. Every sign is a collage of numerous other ones. And it is semiologist who discovers layers of signifying, signifying activities and a particular artifact, no matter whether it comes from fashion, literature, or sport. It is that, sorry, just a moment. It is that easy come and go between different orders of science, fields, and dis disciplines, their mutual and limitless play of substitutions and reciprocity that enabled series of transpositions of sociological, anthropological, and psychological doctrines into another paradigm. Lévi-Strauss was first who, transpo who transposed Marcel Moss's theory of giving and social exchange of primitive societies into a new paradigm, where all exchanged objects between tribes lost all its intrinsic meanings in order to become tokens in generalized social exchange whose only purpose is survival of the communities as such. Other transpositions will follow, and Lacan with Freud, Althusser with Marx, and so on. 
later Okla will do, will do the same with Gramsci. But one could also find the uses and principles of strong equivalence elsewhere. For example, in Habermas's project of commu communicative rationality, which intends precisely to abridge heterogeneous discourses and disciplines to establish consensual rationality, which would reduce possibility of exclusion. In that sense, strong equivalency marks a culmination of modernism. Second concept is that of restrained or minimal equivalence, maybe even negation of equivalence. Figures of that one is at work at numerous theoretical works in the 70s, and most of them are under the sign of crisis of representation and existence on difference and singularity rather than on identity. The most emblematic philosophical figure here would be François Lyotard, with his notion of différent. I don't know what is English translation of this word, decision, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and différent is designed to block, in fact, any equivalency, that is to say, any exchangeability and reversibility between genre of discourses, or if you want, language games. Conflation of them would be inadmissible act of rational totalization, which, which final consequence, according to him, but also to Adorno and some others, is a gas chamber, annihilation of those who could not be incorporated in the sameness or semblance established by an equivalence. In order to preserve authority, one should not identify it, grasp it, but, but witness it, witness intensity or shock of the sensible appearance. Here Lyotard, Lyotard clearly echoes Emmanuel Levinas, who will hugely influence also Jacques Derrida, especially the later one, who will conceptualize politics in very similar terms as hospitability, receiving stranger at the risk of destruction, the host itself. Because every other is totally other, as he is, as says fo famous formula of Derrida, tout autre est un tout autre. What we witness here is clearly an ethical drift of non-identity. These authors see in principle strong equivalence embodied in, in structuralism as sort of utilitarianism which conflates commercial and symbolical exchange. But they respond to, sorry, but they respond to it only by an ethical imperative. Uh, yeah. Yeah, only by ethical imperative. Interesting response to the same problem gives uh, Georges Bataille, who just reverses the problem. According to him, one doesn't obtain a symbolical surplus value by symmetrical exchange, but only by non-productive expenditure. Only those acts that subtract itself from the exchange economy, like luxury, sacrifice, erotism, or ecstasy, represent fundamental experience and determine essential social and individual life, which capitalism wants to neutralize with calculated, balanced, and productive expenditure. But if Le Derrida and Lyotard find their refuge from universal exchange without limits in ethics, but I didn't go too far from them when he found his refuge in counter-economic mysticism. Yeah, it is basically a sort of mysticism. Third concept of equivalent, equivalence emerges as it um, emerges as a reaction to the first two. And it is uh, presupposed notably on the work of the authors I have mentioned, of Laclau and Rosier. One could call it political equivalent. Uh, it is not a form of compromise of previous two concepts of equivalence since they are incompatible. For politics cannot operate with total strangers as elements of political community, nor it can sustain total indifference of individuals forming that community. Politics obviously has to do something with the very introducing of and difference in given forms of social exchanges, difference or, or the other, 
that is in the same time substitutable, accountable as a part of community, but remains an authority and performs a modification in the, in the relationship of the same and other. In other words, just to move my page, in other words, the same and the other stay close to each other without being strictly separated nor conflated. This particular zone, or let's call it a loosened regime of equivalence, where equivalence is potential and not actualized, is precisely a zone of political intervention. For both Laclau and Rossier, we uh, have shown that politics necessarily involves its own way of counting that is always sort of miscount. That means that uh, politics introduces difference in counting of the simple commercial uh, or sign of equality, or introduces the sign of equality there where nobody sees uh, this equality. But to do so, to make possible, for example, identification of demos as a whole, as a people, one needs to organize a regime of equivalence which doesn't belong to commercial, not to gods and monsters, that is to say, to holy others. And to equality, to be political efficient and to take place in general, we need precisely this regime uh, of loosened equi equivalency. Uh, basically, I would stop here because uh, I think this is kernel of what, what I would say. I, I have read some ramifications of, uh, of this uh, basic outline uh, in a way how, um, although the Aristotle, uh, monetary circulation uh, or exchange of goods in a way competed with the uh, circulation of, uh, of the words in the public in a way, and uh, political exchange and polit political polemic. Etc. But I don't see necessary that uh, I go now into detail of it. But I just want to to stay here and to and to discuss very uh, basically it has a uh, sense to you. You know this idea of equivalence of what I wanted to do with it and uh, how it uh, uh, basically not only illuminates um, the uh, history of uh, intellectual history of the last 30 years, let's say, or even more but even uh, stays as sort of uh, condition of possibility of politics, if, if you want to, politics to happen, you know. As I already said, and uh, as already uh, Greeks told, you know, you cannot, uh, you cannot make politics with uh, total strangers, that, that those are basically, you know, gods and monsters, and at the same time, sort of equidistance of commercial activities and conflating uh, political exchange that is polemics and uh, you know uh, to the simple let's say uh, co uh, commercial sort of uh, generic uh, communication as it is uh, supposed in for example in Levi Strauss you know so okay I would I would I would stop here and uh, would see what what will happen. Now. <laughs>